I know you know that song. Yeah. Don't lie and try to act like you don't. You're trying to be all spiritual, but I know you know it. Come on. Aruba, Jamaica, ooh, I want to take you. Bermuda, Bahamas, come on, pretty mama. Key Largo, Montego, baby, why don't we go down to Kokomo? We'll get there fast and then we'll take it. I heard Pastor Bob singing that, and I actually saw him going. He's there. He's there right now. Some of you may be saying, what in the world are you doing singing Kokomo in the house of God? Well, I'll tell you one thing. If you have any religion in you around here, we will drive it out. Because we are not religious at the bridge. We believe God wants us to have fun, yeah? Aruba, Jamaica. Oh, I want to take you. Bermuda, Bahama. I'm glad that Cedric, just for accountability's sake, Cedric was pointing at his wife, Lauren, when he said, Come on, pretty mama. I just want to make that clear. Thank the Lord. Key Largo, Montego, baby, why don't we go? But the key to this song from our, for our playlist series today is found in the little bridge at the end of the song that says, everybody knows a little place like Kokomo. Now, if you want to go and get away from it all, Let's go down to Kokomo. Everybody knows a place like Kokomo, the tropical island. They said it was off of Key West, where you can go and get away from it all, a place where you can leave your cares behind, sit in the sand, sipping my ties with mama, and forget about whatever has been facing you. You may say, well, what's wrong with that? I'm down. Well, one thing is it doesn't last. You go to Kokomo, you go away, and you got to come home. And those cares that you tried to escape still are there. Second thing is it doesn't exist. Kokomo Island is not a place. When the Beach Boys were asked to put it, they, you know, they were, they were famous in the 60s. They were on everybody's playlist in the 60s. And we get to the 80s, and, and they, they needed a song for Tom Cruise's uh, show, new movie, Cocktail. So they pulled the Beach Boys out of their geriatric hospital. And they said, give us a little ditty. And Kokomo makes it on to that movie and, and kind of revives if you will, the Beach Boys career, if you could call that a revival. And, and then later they were asked about it and, and they said this, that Kokomo doesn't really exist. We were just trying to find things that sounded cute in the song. So Kokomo is actually a city in Indiana. Ain't nobody going to Kokomo to escape nothing. If you're live online or watch later, if you're from Kokomo, Indiana, God bless you. Come on, shout out to Kokomo, Indiana. 
We love you, but we ain't trying to go on vacation there. I, when I read that, I thought, that is so funny because it's so true. We're trying to go away to places that don't exist. And most importantly, you were born for more than escaping your trouble. Now, listen, I'm not talking about going on vacation. Everybody needs to go to vacation. But I'm talking about escapism. I'm talking, my wife said, yeah, we need to go on vacation right now. Come on, let's go. But I'm talking about escapism and how the church for too long has wanted to try to find a way to evacuate this planet. That's what I want to talk to you about for the next few minutes. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we were born <laughs> to change the world. Father, I pray that you would help me preach your word today and say what you want to say. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. God, I pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in everything we say. And don't let any of us walk out of these doors the same way we came in, but let us be changed by your word and by your spirit. If you agree, say yes. So really, all this begs the question, why is Christianity the only religion, major religion in the world, trying to leave the planet? Why are we trying to go to some imaginary place in, in our mind while we're here and then ultimately go to a very real place called heaven, but, but why are we trying to escape there rather than dealing with the realities that are here. We're the only major religion trying to leave the place, and we're the ones that have the title deed to it. We're the ones that are called to make the difference. I believe this idea began right after the resurrection. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Acts chapter 1. If you didn't bring your Bibles, we're a full-service church. So we're going to put it up on the screen for you. But if you want to look along in your own Bible, you can. Sometimes that helps in paying attention. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. After his suffering, Jesus, he, being Jesus, showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Everybody say the kingdom of God. Come on, say kingdom of God. So Jesus appeared and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. Verse 4. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for this gift of the Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So they hear again about the promise of the Holy Spirit, and, and then their response, or when they met together, they asked him, they said, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? These guys were obsessed with the idea that Israel's kingdom was going to take over the kingdoms of the world. Because they had been through so much already, they had no idea what they were about to really go through. But because of the persecution of the Jews for centuries, they were saying, this is going to be our turn. And so they were obsessed with, with this idea that, that, that you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel. And Jesus said... Is it, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father is set by his own authority, verse 8. But you will receive power. Everybody say power. power. Come on, touch your neighbor and say power. power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Jamaica, in Aruba. <laughs> Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. <laughs> The ends of the earth. Da, da, da. Anyway. <laughs> and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Just notice he doesn't say, just, just a side note, he doesn't say Jerusalem or Judea or Samaria. See, some people say, why is the church trying to go win the world when they haven't won their own city? See, Jerusalem's your city. Judea is your region. Samaria is the places beyond you. And the ends of the earth is as far as you can imagine. And so some people will argue, why are you trying to reach the whole world when you haven't reached your city? But Jesus didn't say, this isn't an either or text. It's a both and. 
So we're trying to reach today, we're going to go to the water park. Tomorrow, we're sending a group to Guatemala. Come on, are you here? La last week, we sent people to other places. We're going to go to Africa in a few weeks. We've been to Southeast Asia. We've been to Poland and Europe. So we believe at the bridge, it's not either or, it's both and. Yeah, that's good, that's good. Somebody say, it's a both and gospel. Number nine, after this, after, after he said this, excuse me, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. So, so these guys were standing around, they're talking, and Jesus said, they're saying, when are you going to restore the kingdom? He said, don't worry about that, that's not your business, that's up to the Father, when, when, I'm a, when that's going to happen. He said, uh, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, he's going to bring power, somebody say power, power. and you're going to be a witness to change the world. And then he leaves, goes up in a cloud. And they're like this. And they're just staring, wondering, what do we do now? Now, in the bridge, we're in a season of suddenly. Somebody say suddenly. And then, now y'all are getting it. I love it when you're so robust with your responses. That's great. Anyway, keep that up. We'll do well. So, we're in a season of suddenlies. And in the next verse, there's an amazing suddenly. Verse 10, it says, they were looking up intently to the sky. I told you. They're just staring at the sky. As he was going. And then suddenly, there you go. Two men dressed in white stood beside them. Now, who are these guys? There's an, they're angels. Somebody say angels. So, send some angels. Come on. Get a little monotone there. Give it a little voice inflection. Now then, verse 11. Jesus, or, or excuse me, these angels appear and they speak to these guys and they say, men of Galilee. Why do you stand here looking at the sky? The same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. So they're standing there just staring. Jesus is talking to them, telling them about the Holy Spirit, telling them about power, telling them about taking over the world, telling them about making a difference, telling them about changing the world. Then he's gone, and they're just going. Then angels appear. I mean, Jesus, he's gone in a cloud, and then angels show up and Crazy. I don't know about you, but that's pretty wild. I hadn't had angels in my bathroom this morning. And they go, they said, quit staring. Quit staring at the sky. So why are you looking up? Because Jesus just told you that the Holy Spirit is going to come get in you. So now you don't need to be looking up to the sky. You need to be looking out to the world. It's time to stop looking up to where Jesus went and where you're going one day and start looking out to the world around you so you can make a difference. Yeah, yeah. Quit being stargazers and start being world changers. So these men, after they had this angelic visitation, and, 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 and he was said, stop looking up they got it they went and changed the world the bible says they turned their world upside down but over time we let our view of where we're headed edit our view of how to live now i call it the difference between eschatology and escapology some of you say what does that mean i'm glad you asked i'm gonna tell you Eschatology is your view or the study of the end times. So what is your eschatology? Do you have a, you could be pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. You could be amillennialist. You could be, you could believe that the, the book of Revelation is futuristic or historic or preterist. There's all kinds of different views. Now, if I lost some of you with all those words, praise the Lord means you may not be confused but that's the study of end times everybody wants to argue you know is there a beast in the east and what's going to happen but, 
But listen, I'm not going to fight you over your eschatology. I, I don't care. Really, I don't care. But what I do care about is how your eschatology changes your worldview. So I said, some people instead let their eschatology become escapology. You say, what do you mean? Well, escapology is what Houdini did. Remember Houdini? It's what those, those, those magicians do. You put them in a straight jacket, they escape. You put them in a, you hang them, you, know, you handcuff them, chain them, hang them upside down in a, in, a, in a tub of water, and they get out and before they drown. That's escapology, escaping. And so some people's eschatology made them escapologists. In other words, what they view about the end times affects how they live now. So they're just trying to get out of here rather than change here. And it affected our songs. It crept into our songs. See, really, 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 these guys... What, it's human nature to think, what's going to happen at the end? So they're wanting to get out of here, wanting to know Jesus is, it leaves and they're dumbfounded and all this. But when the angels said, go change the world, they did it. And the church did that until a couple hundred years ago. And a guy changed the, 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 the standard view of the end of the world and instituted some non-biblical ideologies. But it, but it, Again, if that's your theology for the end times, I'm okay, I, I, I can live with it. What I can't live with is if it makes you just want to get out of here and build a theology for the pie in the sky in the sweet by and by because I need some ham where I am in the nasty now and now. I don't know about you, but I need to see something transformed here, not just wait till I get there. And if your theology is all about heaven instead of bringing heaven to earth, and you think you're waiting to leave earth to get to heaven, it changes even your playlist. Anybody grow up in church? Four of you. Come on, anybody grow up in church? All right. A few more. Anybody grow up in church in the South? If you went to a certain denomination that I went to, you sang, we sang some songs that had some interesting ideologies. How about one like this one? It's called, This World Is Not My Home. Should I sing it for you? I grew up on this. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Okay, that one's not so familiar. How about this one? I'll fly away, oh glory, i When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. I found one he knows. He didn't know that first one. There was another one we used to sing, looking for a city where we'll never die. They're the sainted billions. Never say goodbye. Or how about this one? Just a cabin in the corner of glory land. But here's my personal favorite. Uh, it's called I've Never Been This Homesick Before. It went like this. I see the bright light shine. It's just about home time. Bob's singing this with me. I can see the Father standing. By the door, this world has been a wilderness, and I'm ready for deliverance. So I've never been this homesick before. I think that's pretty good. I could do this all day, but I'll spare you. 
But think about those words. I've never been this homesick before. I can see the Father standing by an open door. This world's been a wilderness, but I'm ready for deliverance. That's escape mentality. You talk about a playlist that needed changing. Listen, somewhere in lower Alabama, they're singing all that song. That was somebody's set list this morning. <laughs> but Jesus addresses this personally in Luke 19 when he goes to Zacchaeus' house. Anybody remember Zacchaeus? He was a wee little man. And a uh, wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree. For the Lord he wanted to see. Some of you went to school, Sunday school. Zacchaeus, besides being a wee little man, he was a tax collector. He was a sinner. He was, <laughs> he worked for the IRS. So he was not popular. Jesus modeling what I'm talking about and what life is all about. He did the exact opposite of what the religious do and stay away from Sinners and tax collectors and people that are undesirable. See, Jesus touched the untouchable. He loved the unlovable. He reached the unreachable. It made the religious angry, and, and they were gossiping and saying, who does this guy Jesus think he is going to tax collectors' houses, hanging out with sinners, people that drink and prostitutes, and just this is ridiculous. Jesus says the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And then in verse 11, he knew, the Bible says, that they were thinking that the kingdom should immediately appear. He knew their obsession with restoring the kingdom now, so he tells them this little parable in verse 12, Luke 19, 12. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds. Now, a pound was a mina. It was worth, in Greek, it was worth uh, or equal to, excuse me, a hundred days' wages. Uh, so, so he gave them a hundred days' wage. And he said unto them, Occupy till I come. So Jesus knew that they were thinking he's going to restore a kingdom right now. And he said, listen, let me tell you this story. There was a guy, a king, a nobleman, and he, he went to, this, to receive a kingdom. And he said he left ten guys. And he gave them all enough to live for a hundred days. And he said, occupy till I come back. Occupy. Somebody say occupy. The word occupy in, in Greek means to do business. Some people would say do work. There's a popular YouTuber that would say get stuff done, but he wouldn't say stuff. In 2011, there was a, there was a, a movement that began called Occupy Wall Street, and it was a protest saying that why should Wall Street have all the dominant resources and, 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 and control so many resources when there's so many people that have so little. So it was saying, occupy Wall Street. But how about instead of occupying Wall Street, what if we occupied all streets? Carl Lentz started this whole movement saying, instead of occupying Wall Street, let's occupy all streets. Let's not merely occupy seats in a church, but let's occupy seats in a city. Let's not just occupy sections of a sanctuary, but let's occupy sectors of society. He says it this way, that what it means to, to, for the church to occupy is not, not just to uh, uh, occupy within the church, but to go out and to occupy streets across the earth. And he says, by streets, I don't necessarily mean to, we, we need to embark on an aggressive form of street evangelism, but rather taking the glory of God to the places he's called each of us. Some of us, it's banks, medical research facilities, scientific labs, investment firms, foreign nations, and beyond. 
the next few verses, Jesus goes on and, and he gives a modified version of the parable of the talents. Remember the parable of the talents, there were three. One of them got one, one got two, one got five. The one that got five turned it into ten. The one that got two turned it into four. The one that got one hit it. In this one, there are ten. They all get the same start. So there's a little nuance to this parable where everybody starts from the same place. Everybody within the sound of my voice has the same opportunity to change your world. Let that sink in for a minute. And he says that, that they, nine of them went and did something with it. They went and did business. They took their money and they did something. With it. But one of them hid it in a napkin and said, I knew you were a shrewd businessman, so I didn't want to lose it. And he said, you're wicked. Get out of here. And he took from the one and gave it to the one who had turned his one into ten. But then look at this. The, the, the starting point was the same, but the reward comes out a little different in verse 17. He said, well, this is to the one who, who turned his one into ten. He said, well done, good servant, because you were faithful in very little, now have authority over ten what? Ten what? Ten what? Cities. So here he's saying, if you go and occupy and do big kingdom business, when you advance the kingdom, I'll give you cities. What if we as the bridge begin to take our responsibility in Denton and God gave us Denton and Sanger and Crum and Carrollton and Plano and Frisco and McKinney? Come on, are you here? Wherever you're at online, if you begin to take care of your local place, what if God began to give you more cities? And I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about cities. Can anybody get a vision for cities? Not only in this life, but how about in the life to come? Do you know that we're going to get a new heaven and a new earth, and there's going to be cities in the new heaven and the new earth? And whatever authority you, you have in this life, you'll get exponential authority in the next life. Let that sink in for a minute. There are two guys, two kingdom heroes, one named Lauren Cunningham, one named Bill Bright. Later, a third named Francis Schaefer had a similar dream and, and kind of joined in with them. But Lauren Cunningham started Youth with a Mission. And actually him and Dr. Graham Cato began together about 40 years ago. And they developed this training school. Lauren Cunningham turned it into DTS, Discipleship Training School. Took it parachurch and did missions with it. Graham took it and developed it locally, kept it in a local church called Hatfield Christian Church in South Africa, and, and kept it in the local church and called it LTS, Life Training School. Now we call it Life Transformation School. Dr. Graham has taken thousands, tens of thousands of people through LTS over 35 years, and, and, and Lauren Cunningham and YWAM have taken it through th hundreds of thousands in missions. So that's the roots of our LTS. But Lauren Cunningham had had a dream, and he felt impressed, and he was going to have lunch with Bill Bright. Bill Bright is the starter of Campus Crusade for Christ, one of the greatest campus ministries of our lifetime. And they were having breakfast, and God had given them the same vision. And in this vision, basically, they saw seven mountains or seven sectors of society, and God was showing them that if we're going to change, if we're going to disciple nations, if we're going to take cities, if we're going to change the world, then it's not just everybody coming to church, shouting, waving their hanky, and go back and live life the way they've always lived it. We got to come in, be changed, and then go change the world. Yeah, yeah. And so, if we can put those seven spheres or seven mountains up, if we could put that up, thank you, um, then you can see these, they break it, now there's lots of subcategories, but the major categories are business, government, media, arts and entertainment, education, family, and religion, or church, for us church, and so, so we've tended to think everybody's got to get in the religion or the church mountain, but we learn at LTS and at Nations Changers that really this mountain is a volcano. So you get into it, and then it explodes and spews you out onto the other mountains. 
It doesn't mean you leave the church. It just means that you're equipped to go affect the rest of society. Come on, are you here? And so everybody is called, I mean, we're all called to the local church on one level, but then everybody's called to one or more of these other mountains. So as you leave the church, you affect family, education, arts, entertainment, media, government, business. Caleb, when he, when he came time to go to the promised land, he said, give me my mountain. Everybody in this room has a mountain. Can you shout, give me my mountain? I believe that, that there are people in the sound of my voice in this room and online that are called. See, not everybody's called to the same thing. Some people are called to the White House. Others are called to go change the trap house. Come on, are you here? Some people are called to, to a certain sector of society that if, that if, there are some people, this is a prophetic word for somebody, you shouldn't necessarily get an education for what will make the most money. You should go get a degree in what will be the, make you the most effective to get your mountain. Abraham Cooper said it this way. There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign Lord over all, does not cry, Mine! He says they're all my mountains. And I want you to go affect them all. So this message of Christ's glory must not be evident only within the confines of church walls, but it's got to spill out into the streets. We occupy for one purpose and one purpose only, and that's to give God glory and to see his glory fill the whole earth. You could say it this way, occupying is not the mission worship is. And John Piper, the great theologian, was not wrong when he made this statement he said it this way. He said that missions or occupying exists because worship does not. So wherever we see that worship doesn't exist on any one of these mountains, we're called to go reach that group of people. Then as they become born again, they establish worship there. And we go to the next place. And we, we, we reach where we find where there's no worship. And we create a space of worship to God. Until they're born again, people are born again and create that space of worship. Then they go and find more people. The cycle goes on and on and on. Are you with me today? David's cry in his final prayer in Psalms 92, let the whole earth be filled with his glory. That's our prayer for this generation and every generation. You say, what is this generation? This generation is, is everyone who's alive. So as long as we're alive, we talk a lot about different generations, but really and truly in God's eyes, everybody who's breathing is in the same generation. We may be different ages, we may be different positions in life, but this, my generation, is called to bring him glory. Now listen, in order for us to occupy all the streets for the glory of God, the glory of God has to take up occupation in our own heart, but once it takes up occupation in our own heart, it spills out everywhere we go. That's why, guys, we do things like the water park. Did I see Mike Ledesma? Did I see Mike a minute ago? There he is, right there. Everybody give a big shout out to Mike. <laughs> he looks good today. He looks good every day. So, 11 years ago, this is our 12th water park. 11 years ago, we sent out mailers. And we invited the whole city to come to a party. He said, we're going to have a party at the water park. So we rented the water park. I just called him and said, hey, can I rent the whole build, the whole, not building, the whole water park? They said, sure. I said, how much? They said, $1,000. I said, sign me up now. They got on that it's worth more than that, so they charge us more than that now, but <laughs> praise the Lord. 
And so we rented the whole water park. We gave out backpacks. And I saw on Facebook this week, Michael Desma said, uh, I got a flyer, and I thought, hey, I'll go take my family to a free water park, get a free backpack. But I found a family. And today he's an usher in this house. And his family loves God, serving God. Sometimes you ought to get him to tell you all the things God's done in his life, but you better bring a lunch. <laughs> that same event, we had somebody that uh, was helping us. They've been Christians for a while and uh, very dear friends. And they went and they were serving. You can start helping me anytime you're ready, brother. <laughs> I don't know what you're waiting on. Uh, we uh, we we pass out these backpacks, and uh, I, 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 they're here. It's Lisa. She didn't care. She didn't care. She'd come tell her herself. But if I let give her the microphone, we won't. We'll miss lunch. And Lisa came up afterwards. She, there's, a, there's a single mom, had three or four kids. Arm was broken, a cast, and Lisa was helping serve. And she, she found out later this mom didn't have groceries. And her and John went and bought the girl groceries. She came to have breakfast with us a few weeks later. And she said, Pastor Wayne, I get it. I said, what do you get, Lisa? She said, I get what you're doing. She said, you were telling me, but now I see it. I see it in action. She said, when I, when I saw 4,000 people line up to our party, in 110-degree weather for two hours to come to a water park, get a backpack. She said, when I talked to this mother, and, and she, she's, she's, she's got her baby in one hand, and and a broke arm and pushing strollers and kids in tow. And they said, can we swim, Mommy? And she said, no, we got to go home. We don't have bathing suits to swim. She said, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it, Pastor Wayne. You're not trying to just have another white middle-class church that is for people that all look alike and act alike and think alike and talk alike, but you're trying to create an environment where everybody can come to the party. See, just a side note, I'm going to come back to the party in a minute, but, 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 but listen, this year, now we don't mail out things. That was old school. Now we go on Facebook and, and we do social media, and that's awesome. That's great. Alex Vasquez is a genius. He's wonderful at it. He's a, he, he, listen, we went all in. We were going to spend a lot of money this year. We spent $9 in social media advertising. Come on, $9. We broke the bank, folks. It costs us a lot more to get, get a mailer to Michael and his family. This year we spent $9. You know why we only spent $9? Because you all went on and shared it, and it went mini viral in a few minutes. And within a couple of hours, every ticket was taken. Come on, how many of you think that's all? The first year, we didn't know there was a limit to how many people could come, so we invited the whole city. We got spanked really hard by the water park and said, don't you ever do that again. It was uh, hilarious. And sad, simultaneously. We had to turn a lot of people away. But listen, listen. I, I want you to share stuff on social media. Please share the water park. Please do that because that's inviting your world. But never let social media do what only God called you to do. Never let social media occupy a space in people's life that you were designed to, to occupy. Nothing takes the place of a personal invitation. So, so listen, it's, it's sold out. Don't go invite people to the water park. But if you're coming, you can come with a mission and realize I'm not here to just, 
you know, put on my bikini and float down the lazy river. I'm here on a mission to tell people about the goodness of God. And we're going to have a prayer tent, but don't wait for the prayer tent people to pray. What if you're going down the lazy river, hear somebody saying they have a headache, you lay hands on the Holy Ghost, hits them, they get healed and filled with the Holy Ghost right there. We've had people healed at the water park. What if we start getting people saved and take them straight to the lazy river and baptize them because you led them to Jesus at the water park? Come on, every year I have people come up and say, Pastor, I can't believe, I can't believe that you would let us come here. See, why do we do it? Because we love parties. I think most churches don't have a good party theology. You need a good party theology. As long as my wife is one of the pastors in this house, we're going to have parties around here because my wife is the party queen. But Jesus had a great party theology. And he wanted to make sure he passed that on to his disciples. So he told them there was a king who decided to have a party for his son. And he went and invited a group of people and they didn't come. So he sent people, he sent his servants. He said, go out and invite the lame, the halt, and the blind. And so they invited him to the party. And he said, then they came to him and they said, sir, we invited the lame, the halt, the blind. They've all come, but there's still room. How many of you know there's still room? Come on, there's still room. And, and he said, okay, okay, then do this. Go to the, and I'm going to go old school King James. He said, go to the highways and the hedges. New King James and NIV said, go to the country lanes and roads. But he said, highways, everybody say highways and hedges. Highways, put up that real quick, that, that slide of Greek. Highways in Greek is hodos. And it means a road or a path. So it's an out-of-the-way place. So he's saying, listen, go somewhere that, that, that's out of your way. Go somewhere that's out of your way. Go somewhere that's out of your way and get somebody. Get somebody and bring them. Come on, you can come too. Come on, you can come too. Bring them to the party. Invite some people that are out of the way. I got a party. I've got, I'm having a party. Y'all come on up here. And, 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 and he said, so go. Everybody say, go out of your way. Listen, we're all in the church some folks need to go out of their way. Some people need to leave the building. And, and listen, I want you coming back to the building. But once you leave the building, go out of your way to go into the highways and the hedges and tell somebody to come in. Freaking the cameraman out. Or women. Gender nonspecific. He said, go. Go out of your way and find people, listen, go find people. Listen, listen, if you've had, you say, but I'm older and all my neighbors have children. Listen, somebody invited a guest to youth last Wednesday night, because we have, we have evangelists in youth. They don't have business cards. They don't travel around and preach, but they go invite their school. And so a guest got born again last Wednesday night. Every week, kids are getting saved in kids' church at nine o'clock and 11 o'clock. You ought to go out of your way to invite your world. Come on, are you here? Then he said, he said, go to the highways, hodos, and go to the hedges, fragmos. Fragmos is a barrier, a partition, a dividing wall. And in, in Greek, it was, it was a wall. It was a hedge that kept out vagabonds misfits people nobody wants and so so you go work in your field and and the vagabonds can't get through because there's a hedge of protection partition and he's saying reach through the hedge go through the partition and bring those so, so so what partitions, what barriers, what dividing walls? How about racial walls? How about gender walls? So listen, he's saying, I, I need somebody to go through, get, 
go over the barriers. Get over, go over the barriers. There's some barriers. You got to get over the barriers. Get over the barriers and find somebody and bring them to the, to the party. And it says, whatever barriers have been holding you back, I need you to go. I need you to, I need, it's going to take some effort. This is not easy, but, but don't give up because there's people that are waiting on you to come to them. So will you go through the barriers and find all ages? Listen, somebody, somebody ought to go through some barriers and go, I'm doing this all by myself. And go through gender barriers and age barriers and homosexual barriers and transgender barriers and socio-economical barriers and get them to the party. Now, you've all been invited to the party. Go find somebody else and bring them to the party. Come on, are you just stand, stand, keep saying this, keep saying, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. He said to compel them. First, he said, invite them. But he said, when you go through the barriers, compel them. It's a strong word. My friend called me right before I was going to Australia, the darkest day of his life. I said, we're having a party. It's called LTS. I said, here you come to the party. Come here, Mike. Come here. Come here. This is the best man in my wedding. This was, uh, I was the best man in his wedding. We've been friends a long time. And uh, he was in a dark place. Listen, I didn't just say, would you come to the party? I said, man, we're having a party. I got to compel you. I'm going to use my best horse trading skills. I got to get you to the party. <laughs> and uh, he had every excuse not to come. I told Lauren, I said, help my friend Mike get to the party. Well, registration's closed. I said, we're opening it for one more. We're, we're, we're too full. No, we're not too full. Open it up for one more. Get him to the party. He couldn't even leave his house. Fear had gripped him so hard. He had to practice driving three days in a row just to see if he could drive from his house to the church. But he came to the party. Jesus set him free. And he's driven every day since then. And he's completely free from all of that. Jesus set him free. So is there anybody that you want to invite to the party? Is there anybody that says, God, I will go. I will invest. I will compel them to come. I'll go to the highways. I'll go to the hedges. I'll jump through the partition. Come on. For every eye to see, for the sake of the world, Burn like a fire in me, oh, oh, come on, sing it out for the sake. 